Hi, Bob. Yes, good to be back, Ben, for number 30. Number 30, yeah. It feels like a big, big, fat number, 30. Welcome to Maui. <laughs> You're here. All the people who tap my phone are listening. Yeah, and it's dark here. Dark, dark, dark. And, and it's been... Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N. Okay, you yeah. got that? Right. Yeah, right. Ben Watson. Of course, I'm in London. Mm -hmm. And we, we hope our Brussels mashup guy is listening eventually to this so we can work on it, massage yeah. it. And I feel my voice is echoing in Maui. And, uh, and it I, is. It's resonant. It's right. raising the waves. Well, that's nice. All right. So I want to begin with an email you sent me uh, earlier this, well, last week. And uh, you sent one of your sketches. Are you sending me different sketches or is it the same sketch? over the last few weeks they're different they're different ones okay yeah so it's a squiggly it's 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 an image of uh, what i imagine my tiny note chart is which you can see at fivebody.com but you wrote a description of what you're attempting and you say this picture is an accurate portrayal of the way i see the world now no see the world now what about you it's also the way you hear the world and the way you touch it is probably what you mean Yes. Not just seeing, you know what uh, I mean? So you're going to go beyond the visual in this inventory of characteristics. You say, a definite outcome which has been produced by forces so different in tendency and manners of proceeding that it takes a brainstorm to add them together. Now, that's exactly what I have in my chart. I have five memes, five competing ways of looking at things, all right, or that are, that are general archetypal, uh, been around a long time. So the interplay you're describing a definite outcome the sketch is has been produced by forces so different in tendency and manners of proceeding that it takes a brainstorm to add them together and that brainstorm is the sketch itself that's the result of the brainstorm one example might be the combination of igneous sedimentary and metamorphosed rocks in the earth's crust then you have the contradictory poles of fascism and communism on the politics of petty bourgeois intellectuals then you include the alternate demands of eye, ear, and conceptual click on the mind of a writer choosing a word. That's good. It's conceptual click on the mind. And that, that's like the present little sensory uh, nuance. Or, another part, the various reasons certain objects might appear on a slab of pavement in an urban environment. So you see, you're beginning to include everything. Okay, this is a sketch of everything. We refuse one way, you say, of representing the world. You, we, me and you, my chart, we refuse one way of representing the world because the world we live in is not the result of one way of proceeding, but of many. Now, a lot of people live that way. They just don't know you should get on the radio and make a point of it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know that artists, or maybe a real artists, are trying to do that. Because um, most people on in their normal interactions at work and that they don't like someone who's fanatic about something mm. you know what i mean yeah they, they, most they people say, are yeah that guy I agree. Goes on too much about something most people are unideological aren't they they don't very few people actually live by moralities or systems or or what have you um they they're kind of pragmatic about it aren't they use a bit of this here and a bit of that there if it works and they're kind of skeptical about um plugging into a single idea because they they feel it swallows you up and makes you a kind of um, rather um, scarily boring person. That's right. And so we, when you say we refuse, it's not just you and me, it's, it's most people refuse one way of representing the world because the world we live in, and that's in their private mm. life. In the mm. public life, they get a bit, you know, it's like the old joke, you know, people are great one-on-one, -on -one, but to get them in crowds, they, <laughs> they, mm. they become stupid. So uh, we refuse one way of representing the world mm. because the world we live in is not the result of one way of proceeding, but of many. Can I, can I interrupt myself being read by you, uh, or do you want me to wait for you to finish it? Because uh, well, Let me finish this sentence, yeah, okay. just uh, yeah, this yeah, part. Yeah, right. uh, proceeding, but of many. Contradictory, clashing, occasionally productive meshing, by participants who usually cannot understand other ways of doing things. So the world we live in is not the result of one way of proceeding, but of many contradictory clashing meshing by participants who usually cannot understand other ways of doing things. Now that is natural. You, even though people reject uh, the fanatic view, they live fanatically habitually. You know what I mean? And they, it is hard yeah. for them to see another way of doing things. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, there are various layers to this that that uh, you're making me think of is um 
I quite agree with you that people who um, don't spend their time thinking uh, don't reduce the world to one system. Um, but I suppose we're talking about meta thinking. I'm talking about dealing with the problems that happen after you start thinking so that it's like various we're arguing for a set of things which you need to do once you started thinking to prevent yourself getting locked into a mode and therefore that's if you, right. if that's you don't right. think at yeah. all you're fine but once you start thinking you have to go all the way through to come out where you were at the beginning yeah you, well except it's um, not where you were at the beginning yeah, it's you, different you actually realize you didn't go anywhere or that the process of checking where you thought you might like to go is not advisable uh, you need to, it's almost like constantly being an eraser head, cancelling where you're going. And so you end up back, uh, I guess it's like a good workout. You feel refreshed from the workout and you've ended up back in the same place, same body, still uh, not losing weight. Um, the, something like that? <laughs> I'm shifting to you, I'm shifting to you. Uh, the, what, okay, you say, yeah, it, we're not about thinking, we're about pointing out the pitfalls of thinking once you like doing it. Yes. That's that's pretty much where what I'm interested in. Um, it, I'm not interested in... In some ways, I'm not interested in starting people thinking. I think it's fair enough if they don't think. I'm not necessarily in favour of everybody thinking. But if you are going to think, then I want to point out various things that you should use to make yourself think it all the way through and to, yeah and to avoid the pitfalls that's that's and you it do, and you do that by looking at things that you wouldn't think you would agree with see you got to push your thinking you got to put on what you don't agree with or what you wouldn't you don't think is relevant you have to look in the in the crannies that you're not naturally inclined towards yeah that's um the dirt beneath the rollers uh and, mo and most people won't do that see there's the difference Mm. They they are ideologically against fanatics, but they live fanatically, and they have alibis. I haven't got time. I got to get to work. I got to do this. I got to do that. I haven't got time to do all that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, that haven't got time is is used all the time to uh, <laughs> the time. <laughs> to, to stop everything, um, everything interesting about your life, um, and finally they're dead and they never had time to do anything. Um, and the meta process is we were saying that the uh, majority of humans are cool about things, but uh -huh. they actually undermine themselves in practice. Yeah, so I, I don't think we're saying that any of this takes any time at all. In fact, it's timeless. What we're talking about doesn't take time. It, we're not asking for time. We're not asking people to devote time to this. In fact, if they devote time to it, they get it all wrong. <laughs> you know, good point. It, it's got to it's got to happen in a instant, which is also eternal. Has a relationship between the instant and the eternal. But it's not, um, we're not arguing for some enrolment in some course that takes a long time. No, we're just encouraging to go over here to a James McDougall concert or something that they wouldn't be inclined to and never expect themselves to experience. We're saying come over here a little more. Look at this book, Fitting Its Wake. It's a ridiculous book, but take a look at it. Yeah, actually take the time to have a look at it instead of just shrinking and saying, well, I haven't got time to do that because there are experts who have got the time to do it who do it, and I'm not that kind of person. And it's exactly that that I want to break. I'm more interested in breaking that than I am in Finnegan's Wake. That's right. I'm, I'm interested. And that only takes five or ten minutes. It's yeah. Just, I'm, we're just asking for five or ten minutes. Yes. Yes, that's all <laughs> we're asking for. It's not a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then next week, show up and we'll do another thing completely different for five or ten minutes. Mm. I think I think that I feel like we've almost reached our conclusion here. It's a bit dangerous. <laughs> we've figured out what we've been trying to do. Yeah. So, uh, so consider these shows as five ten minute segments, and then if you didn't mm. hear one, listen to the next five or ten minute segment I, I mean, of it's, this show. Yeah, it's trying to interrupt this streamlined uh, necessity of um, trivial um, rubbish that everybody is so busy pursuing. But any yeah. bit of that trivial rubbish, if looked at in the light of everything, is incredibly interesting. But there's some kind of attention required to the detail which is not being done and frustrates me that it's not being done. 
Yes, so I will interrupt and we'll go back to this uh, okay, email yeah, yeah. you sent me. So you said, if you examine it, the sketch, you will see that my picture is sometimes drawn in black on white and sometimes in white on black, and these contrasting zones rub up against each other in ways that suggest new directions for the drawing's flow. There you are saying, look at this for a couple minutes, notice those patterns, then forget it, then come back, and the drawing should have new impact tomorrow or a different way. So you, you, what we just said is said here a little complexly. Or yeah, well, one of the things that struck me, I mean, just to explain that, I was very surprised. I mean, when you start reading, um, drawing in MS Paint, you, it is easy, as easy to draw in white on black as it is to draw in black on white. Now, when you're drawing on a piece of paper, it's quite hard to draw in white on black it's not usually done people don't usually have sheets of black paper and good white pens you know they're, they're, they're quite yeah. unusual now one thing that i noticed is it's always possible to tell simply because of the shape of the stroke whether or not it's been drawn in black or white or whether it's the residue that the eye can tell you immediately have a sympathy with the line and knowing that that was a gesture that it went down and I don't think this requires any expertise. It's just something you can notice if you look carefully at marks on a piece of paper. It's just something right. you can see. And I was quite surprised by that, that you can read off the trace. You can see what somebody did. You can see through it. And okay. what interested me is if you mix up where the white marks are on black or the black marks are on white, you start looking at the edges, you start getting a slight ambiguity. You can always really see, but as you're drawing you could start thinking of what you're leaving behind as being really the drawing drawing in negative it's a technique which william blake used and theorized and got excited by and you do enter a different realm of drawing which isn't positivist which isn't just saying i look and i mark and i'm a person you're starting to think about this other side which is what you haven't marked as being a thing so it's almost like non-being entering your being you're getting the opposite of what you're doing and and becoming aware of that is suddenly opens up this huge area of possible inventions under your fingers i mean i'm just proposing this as a technique everybody can do and you suddenly find that it a kind of uh, uh, something tips out, you know, uh, uh, all this stuff suddenly you can do because you've realized this this truth about about making a mark. OK, so you have this sketch and it's a uh, an image of how you like to do your poetry or, or Ken Fox's uh, poetry. This is the seamless web, but you can simplify it by saying a metaphor, which we all use every day, metaphors is looking at one thing through another. Mm -hmm. That's what you mean. You look at white on black, and then you look at black on white. You're looking back at the white on black through black on white. That is what everybody does constantly. That's human consciousness. It's a doubleness. You're always looking at something through another. And then that's what you need to realize is the pattern happening all the time. When so you say uh, looking at it through another, do you mean another person? I mean, there's a dialogue such as we're having um, yeah. the, the reason that it's a dialogue is that I say something and then in order to, for me to hear what you say I have to think well what would that have sound like to Bob so what I've said has become objective I've written it in black but suddenly I realize that that you are making it the other way around or that is 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 that That's what you right. meant yeah you don't know you don't know what you mean until you hear my response that's true you you find out what Ben thinks through another, mm. through me or anybody you're talking. If I if I spell back what if I just respond to what you said, that's how you know yourself. Mm. But this is the complete opposite of the people who call themselves the hardcore Zappa fans, who always insist that if you want to find out what Frank Zappa or an artist, any artist really meant, you go and ask them, and then they tell you. <laughs> um, yeah. And, naive, and that and that very naive. and that doesn't have any dialogue in it, does it? You just keep going to the same source. You just keep going to the. You know, you've got a little hole in the wall, printing out ticker tape, and you keep going to the hole and and waiting, and more and more ticker tape comes out, and you keep staring into this hole because that's the source of everything. And you don't seem to understand that the way to understand the ticker tape is to take it out and to read it, and you start writing on it yourself and poking it back into the hole. 
because that no... would be communication with somebody. Yeah, McLuhan summed it up when he said the user is the content. So you you listen to Frank. That's you. That's your version of Frank. And then you go to Frank to see what he says, and you don't realize, no, you're going to find out from Frank what you think of Frank, mm. and you think it re it's relying on his, but Frank usually doesn't tell you. Yeah, well, Frank is different. He knows that, no, it's got nothing to do with Frank, it's you. But, but our idea of that... Uh... The person doesn't know, they, need, they have to approach Frank differently. So you mm. come to Frank not asking what he meant. You present what you think and even make it up, and, and tease them, then oh. you'll get a response. Well, that was our idea of uh, of getting through to Frank. When we used to plot and plan this, listening to Frank's records, it was always that we wanted to present him with what we were doing. We wanted him would, to see... And he would, you and Danny, and uh, that would be the best way to do it. Yeah. Because you find that Frank, he doesn't, I don't know, There's in my mind there's all kinds of dead air situations where people talk to him and are waiting for him to explain to them, and they don't know that the Frank... They want to respond is not Frank. It's themselves. It's, it can mm. only be yourself that's responding to Frank. You created Frank Zappa. Yeah. There is no Frank Zappa from Frank's point of view. So if you go and interact with Frank and totally ignore him, ignore what, it, don't display an interest in what he thinks, he then will tell you what he thinks. Yeah. Because you want to know what he thinks by your difference, through mm. your difference. Mm -hmm. So definitely, you've got to you've got to be a difficult fan. That's the only way to be an interesting fan. Not not a violent fan, but just interacting speech wise. You hallucinate. I mean, I, many times I would tell Frank what I thought of something that he did, and he'd say that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Okay, he would deny that I was on the right track, but I'd get a lot of words from him about it. So I'd find out what he thought. I found out what he thought as he denied what I said. Now, yeah, he, you've he, almost he knew I had the right to think that, but when you engage with someone, they will deny that. That's but, the joke but, of conversation. Yes, and you've <laughs> described to me, I mean, you're describing talking to Frank Zappa, but you've explained to me what I do when talking, in talking in general, or how I deal with reality, which is often to propose the most preposterous um, um, set of connections that I can think of in order to irritate reality so that it speaks back at me. That's right. And, and then, then you find yeah. out what you meant. Yeah. You, you, yeah. There's not a paradox. You need to find out what is not you to tell you what you did. Uh -huh. So figure that out. I mean, is there one or two? Uh, are you talking beyond yourself or not? See, that's the subtle dialectic of existence. You actually rely on not you to find out what you don't think. Or what you do think. It shifts. It's black on white, white on black. That figured ground changing is constantly happening. Yeah. And so the, the average mm. person, the average consumer is fanatic. They think it's only one way. Mm, this and, goes back, doesn't it, to the Wittgenstein thing about the, the rabbit or the duck, the figured yes. ground, or the, um, the optical illusion where you have a picture of two lovers about to kiss and you can see it as a vase or you can see it as two lovers kissing. Yeah. And often this is taken uh, by quite miserable philosophers into a kind of tragedy that either you see it as one or you see it as another. Well, and Wittgenstein what... said, we cannot speak of some things. Remember that famous line? <laughs> yeah, da hum muss man schweigen. Yeah, of, over that which you can't speak, uh, you must, <laughs> must be sil silent. Which is tautology. And yeah. uh, tautologies always have a great sense of grandeur and... Um, miserableness about them um, yeah but here's the thing that statement was probably striking at its time in its context uh, for the audience of people at that time so it's not an eternal value but uh, it might have been striking for he asked you know he reminded people well there's an area of silence that's half the story but what i like about what you're saying about the figure ground changing is instead of it being a kind of awful paradox in which nothing's settled and we can't decide which to go with it's actually the on off of discussion that that interpreting what somebody else has said by um looking at the the, the negative shape of, of what they've said isn't this sort of um oh well but we can never really posit what's true because we're constantly flip-flopping between one version and another it's actually the basis of dialogue and of of living thinking that without that we wouldn't be able to talk and this is Voloshinov's linguistics that um without 
ambiguity in a word, we wouldn't be able to talk to each other. It's the very fact that the signs we use are being struggled over. That when I say a word, it's got a different spin from yours that enables us to have a conversation. If we always meant exactly the same by the two words that we're using, we wouldn't really have any any discussion. Exactly, and I'm, I'm tempted to say that's what was wrong about the statement, one size fits all. But I don't want to get distracted. I'm just but we'll, but we'll be like hardcore Zappa fans who, when they meet, all they can do is, is compare each other's lists of the materials. So <laughs> they can't really talk. All they can say is, I'm same, you same. They're both the same. But if two things are the same, they're not having a discussion. They're just, I don't know what they're doing. They, they might as well be laid out next to each other dead. They're actually being intolerant. Uh, in one of his later interviews, Zappa was asked, uh, you know, what's the solution, when, you know, the post-Reagan era and all that, and he said, well, we should be a little more tolerant. Well, what, uh, he said, all for tolerance. But the thing is, tolerance means you interact with those you don't agree with. Mm. You must learn to engage with them. That's the shaking up of your own tunnel vision. Mm. And, and um, if, but if you can't find anybody yeah. to agree with, then create alternative views just to have someone uh, respond yeah. to them. I mean, I've never had much fun just arguing with people who I disagree with, you know, where it's a debate and you're just trying to score points. I've never enjoyed that. But I think I understand you if... You see, I need a third term. I need a common object. That's why I don't think there's any dialectics without materialism. Because what we need is a external object which is different from both of us for us to struggle over. We need a sign. Our spins on it are different, but it's the same sign that we're arguing about. Which is why... I find, for example, Frank Zappa's music or his albums useful because they are something external to you and me that we can both refer to and then develop our preposterous contradictory theories about and then get talking and then we can actually get somewhere because we know what we're both responding to. And having that object there seems to me useful and that's what art should be supplying us with, is objects for discussion, which are Indeed. external to ourselves and can be investigated and we can argue about. Well, that's what, you know, Finning his Wake ends with mm. the keys to given. That's what reality is. It's the third position given to us. Yeah. And, and yeah. then reality is created by language, and then all the later media inventions create realities. That's the object. So then we can argue over what is the art object that is to be discussed. And today, there's so many objects in the in the mass mind, the, in, in the middle there, that everybody can see, that we actually can't find a common object anymore. That's part of the problem today. Mm, which is why we had a call in some earlier programs for a monoculture, didn't we? We said, sweep it all away, only Dumitrescu matters. Um, let, let's cut all this um, variety this that people thought was so liberating that everybody is allowed to have their own obsession and their own culture and, and everything. is actually boxing everybody in these separate boxes. Let's listen to something that just throws the whole of music into chaos and, and, and dismisses it as, as, as a, a racket. Let's take Dumitrescu and start again. Um, and paradoxically, no, choosing just that one thing can actually allow a multiplicity of opinions to, to arise. And it's finding that thing and positing it, which seems to me the task of the critic, which you um, give up once you accept that, well, I'm merely doing a guide for these people over here. That's right. That's the role of Finning his Wake. It's the ultimate uh, new object for common reaction to. That's the role of Finning his Wake, is to be that object. Because it includes the fragmenting process as a mirror within it, back to you. Mm, mm. There's nothing more perfect. He, yeah. It's McLuhan, as McLuhan said, Joyce solved the Esperanto problem. He yeah. found a way to unite the world. Right, so it's designed as a common object for us all to be able to yeah. face, but it's so designed that no expert can get on top of it and become the interpreter that you, you must trust and not look at the object itself, that they're always going to slip, slip off it because there'll be some area that they don't understand or, or areas of absolute murk which will resist them. And so they can't um, take it over and interpret it in a way that could turn it into a religion. It's basically an anti-religious book against any kind of um, systematic understanding of it from that you could take on trust or yeah 
Yeah, no, like my chart and like your sketch, the, the terms in my chart refer back to Finnegan's Wake. So the, that Finnegan's Wake always is showing the pitfalls of making something extra out of Finnegan's Wake other than its active living role of providing the critical object to work with. You know what I mean? Uh, it uh, also uh. includes warnings about what you're doing as you're doing it. And not just about speaking or writing, but warnings about too much radio, too much television, or not enough computer. He's got all that warning about those environments in there. And then that would come back to when you do your Ken Fox or your talking. You're showing the seamless web of language, but I think it focuses too much on the orality part of language and misses the other things. But maybe you think your words, because you jump all over the place, it's surrealistic, you, um, you think the words are referring to other objects. But Finnegan's Wake points out the environmental seamless web, not just of the seamless web of language. And most people think Finnegan's Wake is just reminding us of the seamless web of language and etymology, but it's more than that. That's what is extra, and that's what the McC Bob, what is it, the McClone Bob Squad is on about. Uh -huh. That part, that part, as opposed to surrealistic Ken Fox's uh, verbal seamlessness. Well, I don't think Ken Fox. Um, so we're talking about um, uh, a poet who's also a DJ on community radio in Regina in Canada. And the James McDougall of Canadian radio. Uh, and recently, well, he's a dropout from uh, the postmodern poetry scene who read my book on Frank Zappa and decided I was correct and, and decided to uh, become oppositional to all his previous uh, allies. And he's written his latest thing is called Scandella of Wascana. And I've been reading it on my... Uh, late lunch show which appears on resonance on wednesdays at two and i'm i'm not sure i agree bob i mean this is an impression you've got of the work when i fold it in with music tracks and me talking on my shows so maybe i've done him a disservice because when i read it i thought this is the first um objective prose i've read since the childermass by wyndham lewis that is has an erotics of enunciation which the and i think it's very semantic i think it's not just the sound of the words it's about death and materials and uh, uh, oil and uh, the world and uh, it's very excited by pumps and the physical um, imagining the physical traction required to make an industrial society work and then below that to make the earth's crust um, appear above the rock it's imagining all that and it's excited by the the fact of imagining it and it um and then it lists it and it and it um encants it um so i don't i don't think it is merely drunk on what words can do it has this strong erotics of, of the physical which also reminds me of what happens when you fall asleep and you fall into the grinding of your own bodily processes and i think it's the atmosphere of the torture never stops by frank zappa which i think is a descent into that zone of sleep um when uh, men fall asleep they they develop hard-ons and it's an erotic area of um complete uh, wish fulfillment where you're you 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 forget the 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 concepts and the you you you, you enter a different part of your um of your living of your nervous system and you connect to your bodily processes and 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 that grinding that sound uh, which you hear in the torch never stops is for me what that is it's this um continuing your uh, email to me this is describing ken ken's writing you say likewise shapes are generated by observation in brackets, the original sketch of Coq au vin. What's Coq au vin? Ah, this is Coq au vin. It's French, and it means um, chicken cooked in red wine. And okay. I found this a uh, very stimulating um, visual object to start drawing um, because it's full of uh, um, tendons and strands of, uh, of the animal's innards um, scattered in ways which, uh, if you trace out with a pen... Um, you get um, something which is very uncomputerish. It's not the kind of facile things generated by fractals and so on. It has a, um, uh, and I feel that because there's a whole ruggedness 
of actuality which computers can't capture and I'm interested in presenting the com the internet world with what I think's been so far missed out and therefore drawing coq au vin is for me my my protest against the um, the smoothing and the uh, abstracting of reality into um, numeric generated imagery. So that is more anamorphosis than fractal. Yeah. Right. So you say likewise shapes, and this is Ken's, I'm applying this to Ken, but you're describing your own sketch. Likewise shapes are generated by observation, the original sketch of Cocobin, gestural reflex or scribble, historic patternings in brackets, Viking, animal art, Greek classical ornament, Celtic spirals, etc. Cartoon motifs, jokes, visual puns. That is what you're getting in Ken's prose, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to show that that is the environment around us. Not in just in language, but in uh, the web, in the wonderful oh. world we experience every day. Yeah, but this is, this is the revolution that we're proposing, is that what we're responding to, which other people say is our taste in art, is not a taste in art. It's a taste for reality, which some art is telling us about. That's right. It's your next sentence. We, you have the drawing as a trace. So Bob and Ben is a trace of incompatible modes of proceeding and mocks the so-called beauty, in fact, sterility, of media which stick to one mode. Mm. They all stick to one mode. The point is to play in the not allowed area between two modes. Now, that can sound dramatic, but not allowed is you come up to someone on the bus stop and you show him finning his wake, and you don't want him to spend much time with it, but you spend 30 seconds describing how the book is a mating of radio and, and, and print. Something like that is not allowed, right? Uh -huh. and, and the point is to play in the not allowed area between two modes. Now, that's the resonant interval that McLuhan made so much about, and that's really what Joyce is working with. Then you say, this corresponds to both the wake, it's as set and finished as the Book of Kells, but the result of so many avenues of interest and ways of using language that it can't be reduced to one vision. See, that's why in your show, and this is a cliche vision, it goes back to the Dadis, or maybe before, the collage, as McLuhan said, collage is the only viable art form in the 20th century. You begin with collage because we live collage, but then how do you translate it into daily life and pol politics? How do you live the collage? Oh. How do you get the politicians to Well, the thing is that I've got, I've got, um, you see, my, and I'm going out for my taste simply as a beginning of um, communicating a, an argument, but I've got um, sick of collage. I've got sick of um, postmodern music, which is snatches of little music stuffed next to each other of incompatible genres. I've got sick of bright, um, bright images I see which take uh, one photograph and lay, lay it next to something from another. And that's why I'm drawing everything again, because I want the um, the splatter of uh, gesture and my body back in it. Because the problem I find with collage is that it can not admit that something is being slapped down on paper by a hand. And I'm interested in doing stuff that's learnt from collage and has the... Um, absolute ease and plastic every, here comes everything of collage everything can go in but I want it redrawn and I think I've learnt this from Cal Schenkel who um, redraws machinery for example I mean Dadaists love to take a photograph of some machinery and then stick it in their pictures because at the time no one did that and it was so shocking and what is this machinery suddenly in a in a in a oil painting you know this is mm. this is so bizarre but um, Karl Schenkel understands that, but then he draws it all in his style, his wobbly pen line. And I find a charm in that and something charged and exciting. And it's almost like um, let's gobble all the um, shocks of surrealism and collage and absorb it so that it then becomes personal expression again, that we can simply we can be individuals drawing and expressing like in the sort of old bourgeois sense but in from a new perspective of having absorbed so much imagery and so many ways of proceeding so it's kind of um expressive and 
single-minded and therefore beautiful because everything is coming from the same hand and I personally think my drawings are very beautiful because they they're, they're all through my hand but after a collage consciousness I mean I'm not doing collage I'm doing drawing that's right and the mono when we say we're asking for a new monoculture the monoculture stands on the 20th century of collage and the best mm. uh, archetypal model of that is Finnegan's Wake. And Finnegan's Wake has Finnegan's this because in Finnegan's Wake the words are smashed into each other and, and, and everything but everything is digested into Joyce's personal rhythm. And I was thinking of John Coltrane when we were talking about um, the non-allowed spaces between two modes that John Coltrane uh, his whole music is about the clash of world scales. He spent his whole time transcribing scales from different world music albums that were scattered around his house. He's writing down all these different scales, and when he's playing, he's trying to, to actually deal with the whole world of music and all the different scales and be able to play his way through it, but in an expressive, embodied way. It's not a mechanic... You see, so many of these ideas have been taken by the kind of academics of modern art, who then take themselves away and the risk of being an expressive person and try to do it mechanically. They're going to combine this and this and they put it on their resume. I combine this and this. It's very good to combine world cultures. But what they actually produce is some horrible um, uh, system of using samples that just sets these things one after the other and has no uh, risk of their own expressive um, um, body in it anymore. Whereas I think John Coltrane is a far better example, a far braver example, because he gobbled it all up and then spat it out from him. And that, yeah, and, and, and Fitting and, His Wake does that. Fitting His Wake is not a mechanical thing, it's, it's just imbued with Joyce's own rhythms. He's prepared to be a lyric poet in the end. But he's not expressing himself in isolation or in hypersubjectivity. That's why it doesn't end. It, it allows you to interrupt it. Yeah, That's he's not, he's so not expressing himself. He's, he's yeah. becoming a channel for um, expressing everything. He's, he, it's not a personal or private expression, but he's, not, um, he's allowing all the words to be digested. He's trusting to his instincts. He's not distrusting the instincts, because an awful lot of... Uh, I mean, Dada starts with um, a reaction against expressionism, but Dada is really a super form of expressionism, saying it's even more expressive of where we are in the modern world to tear up a popular magazine and stick it on a piece of paper than it is to do a, uh, a woodcut of a suffering person. They were really expressionists, and this gets forgotten because they sit down with expressionism. People think Dada's the opposite of expressionism and merely conceptual. It's not. It's an extremely... Expre it punches you on the nose when you see it. It's incredibly expressive art. Okay, so that means it's expressive in the sense it wants an expressiveness returned to it by yeah. the respondent, by the audience. Yeah. It's asking you to, res to express yourself in response. Yes. In it's, it response it's once a reaction. Be. But it's using, you see, I think you can use the expressiveness of expressionism as an offence and I think that's required to make art electric and communicative and worth doing. And I just see so much um, fear of self-expression, immediately assuming that it's got to be bourgeois and personal, which then leads people to a dry, formalist academicism as being, you know, the, the correct way of proceeding. And this has produced the kind of, the, just the roomfuls of dead modern art. Maybe that's why Alice Coltrane, you know, didn't get the point of John Coltrane, and she tried to uh, keep it unresponsive or to make it platitudinous or something. Yeah, you know, she she, she um, pioneered the way into New Age music, didn't she? Because she yes. she removed all the edges and produced a kind of sublime, which hasn't got the writhing, expressive individual anywhere in it anymore, and it's There's not. Yeah. The, li yeah, the line from the Ancient Mariner that McLuhan used to use, uh, we were the first to break into that silent sea, she mistakes the silent sea as silent. Mm. And, and she doesn't understand voice. that we have broken into it and we are we still. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that, in other words, there was a lot of people there before you got there and you've broken into that raucous uh, tavern when you thought you were going up to the top of the mountain and be, to be removed. So this interaction is the issue so when you you can't help but present collage on out to lunch 
and you do it, you think, with a way of altering uh, too much verbality or too much orality or something or, or taste or you target, you produce collage every out to lunch, even though you're bored with visual collage. Mm, well, I'm I'm against a musical collage. I, I um, it's John Zorn has put me off it. Um, because are you doing collage in your show? Um, I'm doing. Um, I'm interested in the space between modes. I'm interested in sh shock, and I'm interested in um, upsetting people's idea of what they themselves like, or. Uh, suggesting that where they thought they were isn't so great or is better than they thought it was. Uh, I'm interested in um, slipping uh, materials that they might think beneath them or above them in a context which allow them to hear them um, for what they are, which is note patterns, which might be pleasing or displeasing to them. So I'm trying to remove the associations of culture so that you can respond to it more directly yeah you you are actually doing what the opposite of what you're stating here the problem with postmodernism it states collage or the com conflicting visions and the not allowed area as an ideal you're not you, you drop that and then you try to start over again and that's why we emphasize uh, Finnegan's Wake we actually can say we now know how to organize society we mm. now have the mm. way to do it. Through and this is, this is the meaning of recorso, which is uh, in yeah. Vico's system of the development of, of humans. He, he sees a crisis happening when uh, all the good things have been achieved, that you've brought the gods down to earth and you brought the heroes down to earth and everything has become democratic and we're all um, uh, uh, talking to each other and there is no mystery anymore and we become rational. He sees a problem with that and it's the task he saw it as um, uh, requiring what he called a recorso which is actually setting things off including all the advances but shaking everything up to come back to a, a new level and the whole system goes round again yeah and we're I'm speaking from the point of the golden age that comes after uh, the recorso the beginning of the new uh, where I'm announcing Fittings Wake as the beginning point We've been through the Recorso. Now, it's not a naive uh, dis, you know, transition past Recorso. Recorso is included. That would be the Tetrad, the enhancement, obs obsolescence, retrieval, and, uh, and flipping into opposite. That process, Recorso, becomes subsumed. So we actually, this show is claiming we're past the Recorso. Yeah, we, we, d we don't. It. Yeah, we don't need. To, I mean, maybe late lunch is doing the recorso, and this is the. Yes, the, the I would say you still out to lunch is still in the recorso message yeah. mode, and this show is past the recorso. That's why we're saying we're the only ones who get it. We've arrived. <laughs> yeah. Left the yeah. Sea. yeah. We're back on land. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're back on land, and you'll notice there's no music, and there's just us. Okay, so now use the take this and use your neighborly example that you were mentioning you wanted to bring in, talking about music. Because m recorded music breaks through to a new democratic level, and this is what's not understood about recorded music. Recorded music is um, mainly understood as a means of a new means of selling music. We used to sell sheets of music, now we sell plastic discs of music, a completely banal repetition of the old capitalist way of dealing with music and that's how it's pop usually thought about it ignores one thing which is that when you bought a sheet of music to play in the past you had to know how to play it now all you have to do is know how to switch on your record player but the performance required when you put on a record is not simply that you l lie on the floor and listen to the music which is what quite a lot of people do with their records um, or all kinds of things people do with their records but the performance is actually you talking about it that you talking about the music and articulating what you think about it is the new level of democratic understanding of your body and history because well, that's the translation that's metaphor music music the ear experience into the mouth experience yeah and but and in translating it you're taking music which is a sedimented content of um the development of peoples um, that's what music is. It's a, a formal um, residue of um, actual practices that every time you hear um, a um, 
a courtly lyric every time you hear uh, a baroque concerto the, these are ways of life embedded in these pieces of music and to talk about it is actually to express or you, you hear plain song or you, you hear church music what you think of all those uh, centuries of people behaving in that way or rock and roll or whatever the music you listen to is you are making a comment on how you feel about all those people having done this stuff in the past and what your opinion is of it and right it, now go into your neighbor okay yeah yeah well i have a neighbor who uh, used to uh, run ray's jazz a record shop in london he's recently like me given up his uh, work to take care of a baby and uh, he came around and we were, I played him, I know he has a taste for slightly dubious classical music, so I put on Rosen Cavalier by Richard Strauss. Now, uh, this is um, erotic Viennese opera where they loved having um, uh, a lead male played by a woman because then um, she, he, could show his, her legs. And they're singing a love duet and he's presenting a rose and it's, like all the uh, very strange kind of high pitch bits of Mozart like s sort of purified into this absolutely effective erotic sound um, and I was playing this to him because I, I thought he'd enjoy it and Richard Strauss uses this percussion over the strings as a kind of strange strings playing and then this jing 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 percussion and I said to him that's where I think where Olivier Messiaen got his Ching 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 from, even though Olivier Messiaen sold it as uh, his total serialism. And you can hear it all the way through to Pierre Boulez. And then Phil said to me, I really like it when people listen to a piece of music and say what they think of it like that. Um, I can't stand people who've been to music college who have been told by somebody else what the history of music is and then tell you that. What I like is people speculating and hearing bits of music and talking. And I said to Phil, yeah, so do I. In fact, that's been the great pleasure of my life is talking with other people about records and suggesting that this might be so and then you might go and do some research you might go and read a biography of messian and find out did he ever listen to richard strauss but believing in the evidence of your ears you yourself because you can listen to a record and being able to take that seriously and talk with other people about it is for me what music gives us that's what popular music listening to music on records is about and it enters a new era, a new realm of your relationship to history, which is embodied in, in musical sound. And this is under attack all the time by people who claim to be experts who are going to take little areas of punk or jazz and then start being the experts on it who know all the stuff and will tell you what the real connections are and what the musicians actually said. And they're denying our right to think about music. And uh, I've got a great quote from Adorno which uh, summarises these ideas for me. As soon as one starts to talk about music, one enters the realm of thought, and no power on earth has the right to silence this. He wrote that in 1957. Say that again. As soon as, I, I as, as soon as one starts to talk about music, one enters the realm of thought, and no power on earth has the right to silence this. Right, so isn't it interesting that capitalism continued over the last 50 years through charging for talk. It's people pay to hear people talk about stuff they're consuming. Mm -hmm. it, that's like the afterimage of the mm -hmm. means of production. It, it talked. That was, that was the yeah. political point of Finney's Wake. The, the, the word talk becoming the new capitalist drug. Yeah. Because that's what you're complaining about. People are paid to be the experts. And that's what everything revolves around. Yeah, what do the experts say? And if you... Um, carry on talking about music and entering the realm of thought you get closed down which is my experience in the world of music criticism and Richard Meltzer's experience is that if you carry on an attitude about recorded sound which is your own responses are primary and th that's the first thing is registering your body's responses to the music and then going out towards the knowledge in order to shape it like you are a magnet and the knowledge is iron filings which are going to be shaped by the interest what you're going to pursue is shaped by your response if you insist on that you get closed down because your responses will not be okay according to the um, known uh, quantities which are quantities of what's sold you because nobody actually fits the demographic 
if you find any individual, they are not the same as what their demographic ought to be. They're irregular, they don't fit. And that has to be closed down if any critic is too loud about insisting on a personal reaction as being primary. They're going to be um, um, shuffled out because they're not playing the game of insisting that everything is um, uh, known and the values are set and the very good stuff is there and you know we know what we're doing and in fact music is so various and multiplicious and uh, so detailed and so ironic there are continually points in it in which the things which are considered completely abysmal can can be redeveloped into something absolutely fantastic i mean this is frank zappa's method continually finding things that you thought were the pits i mean you know music you never want to touch and showing that you can they can be used and that you suddenly get a new insight into history of peoples and what that music was used for and what it meant which is like waking up to history that history is made by people and that right. now, no people you know, are really hateful big pardon and no pe no sets of people are really hateful you know uh, you know yes. you think you can't well, there, stand there, 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 yeah look this is this was the political message of Finnegan's Wake that McLuhan adapted. He, he wrote a letter to Ezra Pound in, on June 22nd, 51, and he says something about the problem in your era, back, you know, the time of the Vortices, uh, was so-and-so, I can't remember what he said, but today, words have become a drug. And he says, I'm working on that problem. And that's why Finnegan's Wake was his political guide, because the Wake, on one level, is showing that the, that the capitalist empire continues through talk, through what we call software. Mm. And it's the software imperialism, which was a new subtle thing. Most of the 20th century people entertained listening to all kinds of stuff and experts talk, and they learned a lot because they never went to school or they didn't know, never heard them. It was always like McLuhan said, the classroom without walls. But the subtle subliminal seduction was that's what was going to undermine any revolution because the means of production moved to talk, and talk now had been the new commodification. That mm. is the political point of Lewis and Joyce, and McLuhan saw that. That's what I'm always referring to. So this and that's talk what you're is objecting to. Is that um, what I would call the the assumption that I mean within media that everything is immediately understood that the current language, which is quite a, a few set of words, is transparent. Everybody knows what everybody's saying, and that Finnegan's Wait reminds you of how alien what comes out of mouths actually is. Yes, and, but it also makes the political point that little one tenth of Joyce that was a Marxist, he wouldn't limit himself to anything because he could do it all. I mean, that great line he said, or well, McLuhan described Joyce as being able to live in any cultural mode that, that existed, go from one to another. Mm. Now, the. Well, one of Marx's favorite quotes was it's an old classical um, tag, which is, nothing human is foreign to me. That's um, what Joyce said, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, now that's, yeah. that's the tolerance I'm talking about. That's what yeah. your little manifesto is. Yeah. Now, the, the interesting thing is that technology had evolved to the point, and this is where McLuhan said Marx missed, that that very ability to live in all cultural modes, the postmodern ethos, is the final gasp of capitalism. That's yeah. what's interesting. Yeah, well, that's what's interesting. But the this tolerance for, for different modes requires an extreme revolutionary intolerance for the um the pseudo um understanding which which keys all this into particular places and doesn't take it seriously and allows us to consume a little bit of this and a little bit of that because we know where it is when in fact we don't know where it is because we're not in it that's right so the specialist experts they are paid to talk on the Android meme in the, in the TV landscape and radio landscape and all that and in Wall Street and yet they will not go to a James McDougall concert. They will not listen to Ken Fox or if they do, they describe it, they'll respond to it as an expert and, and put it on their commodified wallpaper, their lifestyle wallpaper that Zappa used to make fun of. That's the thing. We're in this incredible, so we're saying no more talk. We have arrived at all the solutions. And then you show them Finnegan's Wake. That's your solution? They'll say, well, I don't understand this. How could this be the solution? Well, let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's taught generated by people who aren't us by presenting them with this stuff that we think matters. That's right. That's why Joyce said he's the greatest 
engineer that ever lived. Imagine that. It, not many people know that quote. He said, I'm the greatest, I mean, he might have said the greatest human engineer, but I'm the greatest engineer that ever lived. Why would a guy say that? Well, he understood the imperialism of talk would take over. He held a mirror up with it, up against it, and then he created an Esperanto to deal with it. On a practical level, we could rebuild your churches by discussing not the Bible, okay. but his wake. That's the way you revitalize Christianity or Buddhism or anarchism or any religion or mode that you are fanatically <laughs> devoted to. Even Fantastic, Mexico. Bob. So we hope that by next week, when people listen to us again, they'll all have had a look, at least, at Finnegan's Wake. But I've got to stop you there, because our time is up. Thanks very much, Bob. Thank you, Ben.